right, all right. Welcome, welcome to Freightonomics, the global trade tech summit version of Freightonomics. Now, we've got a big show today. Uh, Zach Strickland, Director of Freight Market Intelligence here. Anthony Smith, Lead Economist, Director of Market Experts. Here helping me out as we decide to tell you what's going on in the freight world as well as give you a combination of big, broad, general look at what's going on in the uh, economy as well and how they both interact. And today we've got a pretty big show, so we're going to cover a lot of stuff. We've got a lot going on. Obviously, 2020 won't quit. We've got a lot of natural disasters, um, you know, really trying to, to jam another needle into the end of the world uh, with the wildfires, uh, hurricanes, just a plenty booming, uh, you know, and the spot market's already really active. But up later here in a little while, we're going to have Dean Waller. That's right. Uh, the, you know, Dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business, professor of supply chain management at the University of Arkansas, going to join us for the last half of the show and give us some uh, nice in industry insights into what's going on. And we're also going to have a nice little discussion uh, over leadership in the transportation space, as well as talk about what he's been uh, noticing going on as supply chains really start to rearrange, uh, you know, amidst all of the, the chaos that has become 2020. Um, so, Anthony, without further, of a, uh, without further ado, <laughs> let's thank our sponsor, uh, Amazon Freight. Amazon Freight, after years of fine-tuning their technology, working with trusted carrier partners and leveraging infrastructure to optimize their logistics, Amazon Freight is now offering shippers of all sizes the ability to tap into their network to optimize your business. Shipping full truckloads with Amazon Freight means reliable capacity, competitive rates, and instant quotes. If you're looking to ship or ready to haul, visit Amazon Freight dot amazon.com to get started again thank you so much to amazon freight and you know the last week anthony that i mean 2020 the wildfires keep going out west uh and and of course this is one of our stories of the day uh you know we've talked about it a little bit and before about how natural disasters really have uh you know this delayed impact to the freight market I know hurricanes are probably the easiest example of that, where we see, you know, these storms come in, uh, really have a two-phase approach. The one is the initial recovery, the, you know, the relief efforts, and the second part is the rebuilding. And mm -hmm. the rebuilding process is really what, uh, you know, spurs that that freight activity that that a lot of these carriers really benefit from. Of course, the the initial recovery stuff is where they stage the freight. That's where a lot of the money uh, gets made, and of course. Thankfully so, because that's a lot of work uh, and a lot of time spent. And again, we, we don't always want to rely on altruism <laughs> just to get people through. But, uh, you know, at the same time, these wildfires are pretty devastating out there, Anthony. Big time. And there's that just kind of adds to the, the chaos that's surrounding the building products material industry. We are talking about forestry products overall, looking at housing starts or just home construction projects or existing homes, um, whether it's these natural disasters, whether it's, you know, those hurricanes or the fires that are going through the West Coast right now. There is a lot going on. And as you mentioned, there's going to have to be a lot of effort put on just through that recovery effort of cleaning up the area and then that rebuilding process of putting new homes back up in place or reconstructing some of these communities that may have uh, really been ravaged and really kind of putting things back in place before we can kind of really start to see some of that new activity. Also want to mention very quickly that I am, if you see me looking down at my computer, I'm not being rude. I am looking at what's going on. We're streaming live on LinkedIn. And of course I'm in that Slack channel. So if you want to jump in at any time throughout this conversation, feel free. You guys can join in on the conversation as well and uh, chat with us while we're going through some of these stories. And uh, if you have any questions for our guests coming up here in, a, in the next segment. Yeah. So, you know, the wildfires have, it, it does look like the wildfires are having at least uh, some, a little bit of an impact up there in Oregon, for sure, in the Northwest. Of course, uh, Linda Baker does a fantastic job of covering uh, a lot of the details of what's happening up there uh, in this, in the article that she wrote about it, basically saying, uh, truck drivers navigate the world's worst air quality. Uh, check that out on FreightWaves.com. Uh, it's a great read, uh, especially if you operate up there, uh, talking about some of the shippers and also just truckers having a lot of trouble uh, navigating that space. And in our data, we're, we've actually seen uh, tender rejection rates, you know, the outbound tender rejection rate for the state of Oregon has ticked up uh, to its highest point of the year at 18.75% uh, currently. Now, again, this is in the middle of, 
what is, you know, I, I guess effectively the Northwest's produce season. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is really where the apple harvest starts to kick off. But also we had a ton of berries, uh, a lot of uh, the hops. Uh, for those of you that like to uh, drink the beer, this is a big hop harvest. And again, that is premium freight uh, that really commands a lot of prices. And and so this is, or higher rates, I should say. And, and you know, so with these wildfires kicking off, making things harder to deal with, again, a lot of the Yakima Valley is inland. These fires are more on the coast right now, I believe, from what it stated. But at the same time, all the uh, the metropolis areas, Portland, Seattle up there in the northwest, uh, still getting a lot of this smoke and haze, right. making things difficult. But the factories around Portland, uh, you know, apparently are starting to shut down up there. So that's definitely something we need to keep an eye on because it's not just it's not going to end uh, once these wildfires go out. There's right. going to be rebuilding, uh, et cetera, that's going to happen. And of course, um, you know, it does have these things do have a long term effect to capacity in these markets. Yeah, and I think the other thing that you mentioned, very fortunate that, of course, damage is damage, whether it's one home or one business or, or however many, but we're looking at it just being on the outskirts of some of these metropolitan areas. So it could have been a lot worse than what it is right now, especially when we're looking at some of these hurricane activities and we're looking at some of these wildfires. So very fortunate that it's not directly in the midst of these larger metropolitan areas. Of course, any damage is awful, but very thankful for that aspect. Yeah, hopefully we uh, we get through this a little bit. Now, of course, the California wildfires up there in the northern part of the state, uh, really, I mean, some of the some of these fires are, are I mean, there's the hundreds of thousands of acres that are burning up there. Um, it's uh, you know, it's it's something out of a horror story, um, you know, and. You know, not that there's a lot of freight activity up in some of these areas, uh, but the smoke and the pollution really does have an impact in, st in a state where a lot of the freight volumes are, you know, this has been the hot spot of the freight market. Uh, over the last several months, uh, Southern California specifically has seen tender rejection rates soar. Now, they have come down a little bit more. Uh, here recently, we're back down to around 25.72% in the Los Angeles metro area. And that's after, you know, peaking at the end of uh, August, uh, just around 30%. So we have stabilized a little bit. And we talked about it a little bit last week uh, when we were talking about how the Northeast was starting to really pick up uh, and see some tender rejection rates increase there. And that appears to have mitigated as well. Uh, the market does appear to be seeing a little bit less on the volume side again, it's still extremely tight out there. Uh, rate per mile, a lot of rate rates per mile over that three dollar a mile mark. Uh, but it does look like things are kind of maybe we've hit somewhat of a peak, but we're kind of middling around this. Uh, you know, some markets are up in terms of uh, rates. Some markets are starting to kind of come back down. Los Angeles being one of those. Um, you know, here in the last several weeks. So it's really hard to tell uh, just what this market has in store for us here in the coming months. I think a lot of people have, you know, we've talked about it, uh, you know, here a lot of times about what do we expect in this fourth quarter? I mean, we're talking about this is the traditional peak. What has COVID done to our, uh, right. our freight market? Uh, you know, have we seen the peak? You know, was it around Labor Day this year? You know, we talked to Zach Rogers last week. He thinks that, uh, you know, we will effectively somewhat absorb uh, holiday peak season uh, in the way that we're not going to see tender rejection rates necessarily double yeah. or, you know, jump up significantly. We might see a couple of little bumps, but he doesn't think that there's going to be any real significant uh, changes from what we're seeing today. And what I kind of think, I think he's, I think he's right. Uh, I think we are going to see uh, things kind of middle, you know, kind of muddle around a little bit here in September. We still have plenty of ocean freight coming in. Uh, you know, these carriers have figured out, you know, where to go at least in that regard. So I think they're picking on some of these uh, larger markets, especially Los Angeles. And now they've run back to the Northeast to kind of stabilize that area. But a lot of these smaller markets are still getting dropped. Yeah. <laughs> And, that, yeah. and that's going to be the, the big question moving forward is how much, what other markets are going to get dropped as these carriers kind of flock to these high volume markets, uh, which high volume market is going to get dropped? You know, we saw Atlanta, uh, which had been really hot, to start to stabilize quite a bit here in the last week. Um, but again, it's not dropping tremendously. You know, it fell from a peak of over 25%, but now it's it's hovering right around 22% on the yeah. tender rejection index. So it's not like we're going to see, I mean, 
the difference between 25 and 22 percent isn't that big, you know, in, in my mind. Um, so I think we're still going to see plenty of freight moving through the system. Uh, we've talked about how capacity uh, may not be coming in online as fast as it did in 2018, uh, which created this really stable 2019 environment. Um, you know, people aren't necessarily investing as much. However, we did see trailer orders uh, pick up here in August. Uh, so they are investing, you know, that's one of our, that's our last story of the day. Uh, trailer orders, uh, you know, basically post posting their biggest month since October of 2019, Alan Adler, uh, writing this story on freightwaves.com effectively outlining, uh, the fact that people are spending money and they're investing again. Yeah. And, and, you know, this isn't necessarily news, uh, but it is news in the freight world. Um, the fact that people, OEMs, are starting to see backlogs in some of their, uh, you know, especially in in orders for these big type of, you know, non-recreational style equipment. You know, we talked to your your cousin a few weeks ago about some of this. He was hauling pools. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing a lot of orders for these, like, recreational, you know, boats. Um, and, uh, you know, sorry to the people down in the Florida coast, uh, a lot of boats piled up there in the Gulf Shores area. Um, again, unfortunately, it looks like that insurance does not necessarily cover uh, damage from hurricanes on the boat side. Yeah. So that's that's not good news. Hopefully everybody's all right down there. Um, but yeah, this is like this is that industrial production that we've been waiting on. Uh, coming back online, that's starting to really pick back up a good bit. Is there anything else that you've seen in the industrial space that makes you feel better? Uh, on the industrial space, definitely seen that there's been a, um, a a fair amount of activity when we're looking at industrial production, especially on a month-to-month -month basis, when we're looking at um, overall movement for things like the ISM, PMI, the Person Managers Index, that's been well above 50 over the last few uh, months here. And now the Good thing again, of course, you always have to look at the ISM, what the aspect of that is diffusion index and it's based on the month before and based around the number 50, but it's been expanding on a month to month basis. And we've seen um, overall expansion. We're looking at the uh, overall industrial production number and we're looking at industrial production. We saw the most recent number that there was a 0.4 increase in August. Um, this is smaller than some of the other monthly gains, but um, it's still down around, uh, I think just over seven and a half percent on a year over year basis. But we are are seeing um, that overall rise in, in the industrial sector, especially when we're looking at that month-to-month -month segment. Um, and, and that's one of the other aspects. It's easy to get caught up in some of those large monthly swings just because we want to know how fast a recovery is, is happening right now and what's going on overall within the economy on a month-to-month -month basis, week-to-week -week basis, even looking at weekly jobless claims and things like that. But um, when we're looking at the industrial sector, we are still seeing that monthly increase. It's just kind of slowing down. Um, we even saw slowing uh, retail sales over uh, in this most recent month of data um, overall, which we can kind of jump into a little bit later, but we just saw that um, there was an increase of 0.6%. Um, this was despite the, the, the increase of federal aid, but um, that's going to be another area that's going to be a high driver of freight. One of the things that we might be looking at um, in the... Definitely. Yeah. And, and one of the other things that we still have to account for somewhat today is called Amazon Prime. Um, that's supposed to be happening, I think, in October, uh, early October at some point. October Prime Day, like we need some more e-commerce. We need more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that'll be interesting to see play out. Uh, you know, I, I think it will be fascinating to watch. Um, right here, right before the break, uh, you know, I wanted to touch on the hurricanes real fast before we hit on the break and get into, uh, you know, Dean Waller and, and, and the discussion with him. Uh, but, you know, the, the hurricanes did not have a big impact. You know, we just got through with Sally. It just kind of came through. Of course, it had a huge impact in terms of the Pensacola, Gulf Shores, Alabama area. Hopefully everybody down there is okay. But in terms of having an impact to capacity as they normally do, not a lot of action, at least in terms of our data. So, um, you know, the hurricanes, you know, a lot of that activity probably was absorbed into, uh, you know, what's already a very destabilized marketplace. That's right. my theory, at least. Right. Well, well, I guess that, uh, you know, that wraps up our first segment here. Uh, you know, we're going to go to commercial here briefly, but we'll be right back with uh, Dean Waller and have, you know, I'm sure he'll have a lot of interesting stuff to say uh, about the transportation sector. And welcome back to Freightonomics. Thank you so much for tuning in and 
while we're thinking individuals, thank you so much to our sponsor, Amazon Freight, after years of fine-tuning their technology, working with trusted carrier partners and leveraging infrastructure to optimize logistics. Amazon Freight is now offering shipper of all sizes the ability to tap into their network to optimize your business. Shipping full truckloads with Amazon Freight means reliable capacity, competitive rates, and instant quotes. If you're looking to ship or ready to haul, visit Amazon or freight.amazon.com to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for our sponsors. And we have a special guest here with us, Zach. Yes, Dean Waller. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on Freightonomics. Oh, yeah. This is this is the show to be on for sure. Um, it is. <laughs> uh, so, you know, tell us, uh, you know, you, you've been on so many of our, our, our productions here in the last uh, little bit. Uh, you know, but for those that, you know, I can't imagine there's anybody out there that doesn't know who you are at this point, uh, especially anybody that follows FreightWaves.com. Tell us, uh, Dean Waller, tell us, uh, you know, give us a quick intro. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Matt Waller. I like to clarify that because some people think I'm called, uh, my name is Dean. Dean. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm often introduced as Dean Waller, but yeah, I'm, I'm Matt Waller and um, I'm Dean of what's called the Sam M. Walton College of Business. Um, and we, um, it's a business school, a large business school. We have about 6,100 undergraduates and about five or 600 graduate students. Um, but we're in Northwest Arkansas. I've been here for quite a few years. Northwest Arkansas is very logistics intensive. Got a few, um, got a few companies up there, uh, that yeah, have something I mean, to do with it. <laughs> from transportation, of course, we have J.B. Hunt, P.A.M., uh, FedEx Freight's not very far, J.B. Hunt, uh, ArcBest, uh, and others. But but then if you look at the shippers side of it, you know, of course, we've got Walmart. But we also have about 1,500 CPG companies in northwest Arkansas that uh, tend to be more logistics intensive because, um, you know, even salespeople in northwest Arkansas and these teams here mm -hmm. wind up knowing quite a bit about logistics because... Uh, it's so important to Walmart. Oh, yeah, for um, sure. So there's, there's a huge amount of uh, expertise here in that area. Um, and so we have our undergraduate program in logistics and supply chain is the fifth largest in the country. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you are you were just awarded the number one uh, program <laughs> in the country? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're right. Congratulations. <laughs> Gardner uh, ranked this uh, number one in uh, undergraduate program in North America. We're thrilled for that. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, um, and I personally have been involved in supply chain and logistics for a long time. Um, I've had a consulting company, a software company, um, and 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 uh, then I became a professor um, here in the Walton College. And um, even though I'm dean and I'm outside of the day-to-day -day types of uh, work on supply chain, I pay attention to it still, and I pay attention to it in one way through following freight waves. In fact, <laughs> it, kind of a funny story real quickly, I, um, I kept seeing a few years ago graphics that I would like on, um, on LinkedIn. I'd, I'd download them and look at them and send them to someone in my department or something, you know, or share it with someone at um, one of our alumni at one of the companies in the area. And I started noticing, it kept saying freight waves, freight waves. I'm like, who is freight waves? <laughs> um, and I eventually uh, found out and really started following freight waves and then had the good fortune of meeting uh, Craig Fuller at dinner with him um, a couple of years ago at an event here in Northwest Arkansas. But, uh, but so anyway, it's a pleasure to be on here. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Now, I want to dive into a topic that I am actually, you know, very interested to talk to you about. Uh, and that's this concept. And we, we talked about it briefly, uh, you know, in the past, uh, this concept of leadership versus management in the transportation sector. And, and I think you make a you made a really good, you know, insightful point on the difference between the two. Uh, and, you know, I think I, I'd love to hear your thoughts around, you know, why these two things are you know, different and why one uh, may be more important this year versus last year, if you could go into that a little bit. 
Sure, absolutely. It'd be my pleasure to. Um, well, I got interested in leadership as a subject back in 1982. My father gave me a book um, about, it's, it was called In Search of Excellence. You may have heard of it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> out of date for sure. But, but I read it and it got me interested. And ever since I've been studying it, I read a lot about it. I've led consulting firms, software company, and, um, and now the business school here. But, um, you know, the, there's a guy by the name of John Cotter, uh, a famous professor, and uh, he once said the main difference between management and leadership is that management is about dealing with complexity and leadership is about dealing with change, whether that be uh, adapting to change or driving change. And so, um, but if you look at transportation, not just transportation, but logistics in general, the market most of the time rewards efficiency. Right. Okay. You know, reducing costs. Um, it's and, that cost cutting uh, mentality. <laughs> And effectiveness as well, effectiveness. Right. And, um, and so those are really things that you achieve through management primarily, dealing with complexity. So you, you, you make plans, right? Uh, plans are deductive in nature. They're, you know, where do we want to get to? Uh, what's our situation? Um, they're very deductive. Same with budgeting and um organizing, problem solving, staffing, et cetera, et cetera. All of that's about management and all of that is really good for efficiency until it's not good. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the management style, you know, what you're talking about, just to summarize real quick, I think is, you know, you have a set of known variables and basically you can plan around those. You can effectively get the most out, the most efficiency out of those variables that you possibly can in your operation, uh, and you just kind of move along. You plug along knowing that, you know, you have a relatively stable environment to operate in. Is that correct? That's correct. You get, you get better and better at, you know, routing. You get better at uh, scheduling. You get better at hiring and retaining um, these kinds of things. But when change occurs... Uh, I think back to the Motor Carrier Act of 1980 when uh, trucking was deregulated, right? You saw a huge number of firms go out of business. Some firms stayed in business and then they excelled, and some of them are still around today. That was an extreme example, but the companies that had the strongest leadership made it through that because leadership's about dealing with change. And so the key to dealing with change is, right, you've got to be able to collectively set a vision, set the direction of the organization. You've got to do it in a way that people get aligned to that vision, that direction. So you've got to include them in that. And, um, and then you've got to motivate them to move right. forward. Yeah, because not everybody, you, uh, not everybody on the on the ground floor likes to to deal with change. A lot of people are resistant to that because that's not what they do. You know, they they were there to set. This is my job from a nine to five, <laughs> and uh, then they, you know, once you tell them they have to divert from what they've gotten so good at, they get a little resistant to that, right? Exactly, and it's sometimes comfortable to just keep doing what you've always done, and just pray for the best, right? But that just doesn't work uh, in, in the long run. Um, so, so a lot of the firms that made it through deregulation, of course, had great leaders. That doesn't mean they're going to do well through the next turbulent times that come up. And it's not always turbulent times. It's also taking advantage of opportunities. You know, I'm sure you two, you're here, you hear about, you were talking earlier about the uh problems in um, Oregon uh, with smoke and, uh, you know, this huge growth in, um, in freight traffic in um, Los Angeles and that area. Oh, it was yeah. just everything so uncertain. Mm -hmm. And you all were talking about that earlier. Yeah. But the other thing, 
Go ahead. I think, Matt, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is being able to adjust to certain amounts of change within the industry. And I, I, I'm almost pity someone that just came into the industry in, say, 2017, when there has been drastically different years in freight in 2017, 2018, 2019 to now. Um, and then now, even this year, there's been maybe even three or four significant factors to get account for. I think previously, you know, in the earlier mid-2000s, you have this seasonality, you have these expected changes in, in the industry. And I think that's how, how you're just kind of speaking to how effective leadership kind of comes into play when you have these uncertain times to really be able to navigate in such a, a nimble way. Absolutely. And you look, you know, companies, some companies can be entrenched and still navigate change. I mean, I think of, you know, Walmart just as an example. I mean, you know, they had started implementing um, Walmart grocery pickup, you know, where you can go to the store and pick it up after ordering online. They've been building that for a while, but when COVID hit, the demand for pickup soared, right? And so Walmart had to really figure out how do we make this more efficient? So sometimes you, you know, it's not like you just need one or the other. You really need leadership and management all the time, but the degree to which you need it at times change it changes. Oh, it's definitely a sliding scale. That that makes total sense. So, you know, it, Freightways had its own uh, little example of what you're talking about with our uh, with our media side. We were really just in the early stages of developing. You know what you're seeing right now on TV. Uh, you know when COVID hit, but it just so happened that you know, the market was in great demand for the TV. So we had to, we had to react quickly to that, uh, you know, as people were sitting more in their houses and, and now they can, uh, now they can get all their freight news on, on YouTube and other, and other channels and freightways.com, uh, and all these streaming uh, services. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Freightwaves is a great example of another aspect of leadership because the other aspect of leadership is being able to create new markets when things are going well. I mean, really, I think I think Walmart's example of um, creating grocery pickup, they did it at the right time, and thank goodness they did it, you know, um, because then when COVID hit, it was really <laughs> incredible. Now, with freight waves, though, think about it. I mean, freight waves developed a media capability it is unmatched in the world in the area of logistics. I mean, I, there's nothing else like it. But what it does is, I mean, it really, you, you wind up driving lots of traffic uh, to your site, for one thing. Um, but also with something like, um, you know, your software as a service, Sonar, you know, you're... you're I mean, sonar is a great thing, but how many software as a service companies really are also a media company? I mean, it's kind of a rare thing. Not, not um, maybe so one Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, Bloomberg is an example of that in the in the uh, finance space, right? Uh, for sure, but it's it's hard to think of very many examples of that. But it's it's a it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I know, don't want to spend I don't want to spend a lot of time tooting our horn, even though you know we're amazing. But the uh, <laughs> you, know, you know I wanted to get to we've got about four minutes left, and I wanted to get to you know this you know what we're seeing in the supply chains right now. You know you you're obviously at one of the epicenters of logistics and transportation, sitting out there in Arkansas in the northwestern corner. There, I'd love to hear some of what you have to say about what you've seen or heard about uh, how supply chains are reacting to COVID and all this other disruption that 2020 has become. So one thing that, that I've heard and I'm seeing, and I think it's very interesting, and it, it not only has to do with how we currently operate, but it has to do with software solutions and new technologies. And that is the old way of doing things was, I'll give you an example from inventory management, right? Mm -hmm. The old way of doing inventory management was you look at demand, you try to fit a probability distribution, you figure out, you know, what should be your time between replenishments or order quantities so that you can 
be efficient from a transportation perspective, but you also want to make sure you have enough inventory so they don't stock out. That doesn't work very well right now. It doesn't work very well, and I think that there's a huge opportunity here. It doesn't work very well because um, the environment changed so so quickly. So the big opportunity now is to say, let's not plan that way where we try to find a probability distribution. Let's use more of an experimental approach where over time, as we change in stock targets or order quantities or frequency of replenishment and things like that, we see what turns out to be our in-stock rates, our transportation costs, our inventory holding costs, those kinds of things, and then and then adjust. So I think I think one thing we're going to see is uh, we're going to see a bunch of new technologies produced that use more of an experimental versus a planning approach. Yeah, that's uh, I mean, a technology, you, you hear about it all the time. And, and of course, the implementation of it is a lot easier said than done in a lot of cases. Uh, but the uh, the world that we're living in right now, uh, you know, I, I think there's just there's too much argument for, you know, really going the route that you just said, experimental technology. It's obviously more flexible, a little bit more adaptive uh, than, you know, things that are hard coded for, you know, the same world over and over again. So I think you have to have that flexibility. Well, you know, we are up on our time. Uh, we've got about a minute left. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Dean Matt Waller, <laughs> <laughs> to get all, all the names in there uh, for joining us today. Do you have any last uh, words for the audience before you go? Well, um, you know, I would say this, many people are depressed right now. They're experiencing anxiety. But in 10 years, they're going to look back and they're going to say, I wish I would have realized that this was a huge opportunity. If you're an entrepreneur, there's a huge opportunity for you. If you're a, if you're a big company, there's all kinds of new markets opening. So, so we have to get past sticking to our traditional ways and now doing things in new exactly. ways. Exactly that forward thinking. Well, thank you so much. And of course, stay tuned. Coming up after the show, Dooner and Vincent will close, close out the Global Trade Tech Summit. Thank you all. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I mean, he's spot on with more tech, I mean, right? <laughs> I mean, look at all the great demos we've seen so far in all of these virtual conferences. You try to beat people over the head with it. And it doesn't, yeah. you know, unfortunately, a lot of times,